Hello. It's a pleasure to be here to speak on food allergies. Food allergies can be significantly impactful and affect health and quality of life. But not all adverse food reactions are food allergies. Understanding the cause of your symptoms can help you understand the best course of action to relieve your symptoms. This presentation will review what a food allergy is, symptoms, mechanisms, conditions that mimic food allergies, how to diagnose, and what you should do if you think you have a food allergy. To begin with, symptoms are key. It's important to understand that you experience adverse food reactions and feel unwell to foods, to specific foods, and not all foods. But it's also not enough to have positive testing. Skin testing, blood testing, have a high rate of false positives, up to 50%, which is huge. So if you can actually tolerate a food, despite having positive testing, you don't have a food allergy. Symptoms can vary significantly. They can vary by mechanism, severity, even person to person. The classic symptoms of a food allergy include skin symptoms, such as hives, which are welts that come and go, body swelling, known as angioedema, or respiratory symptoms, including wheezing and difficulty breathing, as well as gut symptoms, including vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain, as well as vascular symptoms, including low blood pressure, which can cause you to feel faint and even pass out. But most worrisome of all is anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a severe, potentially life-threatening reaction. And while there are actually many definitions of anaphylaxis, most experts agree that it usually involves two organ systems or more. What this means is that you can have hives and difficulty breathing, or hives and vomiting. But it's also important to know that you can have not have hives or any rashes and still have anaphylaxis, such as with vascular collapse and difficulty breathing. These classic symptoms of a food allergy happen immediately, within minutes to an hour. But there are also non-classic symptoms of a food allergy. These symptoms tend to be more delayed and can actually occur 24 to 72 hours after food exposure. This makes it actually very difficult to correlate back to what might be the culprit. These symptoms include eczema, which are dry red patches on the skin, abdominal pain, difficulty swallowing, known as dysphagia, and food impaction, which is when food gets stuck in the throat. And we'll talk a little bit more about these mechanisms later on. So what is a food allergy? It is an immune system reaction to a food. The body's immune system keeps you healthy by fighting off infections and other dangers to good health. A food allergy reaction occurs when your immune system overreacts to a food or a substance in a food, identifying it as a danger and triggering, triggering a protective response. But instead, this response actually makes you sick. The immune system is directed specifically towards proteins. These are the food allergens. Proteins or glycoproteins, and a glycoprotein is a protein with a carbohydrate stuck to it, are what stimulates the immune system. It's not a fat, sugar, or carbohydrate. These tend to be very small glycoproteins, which are generally heat resistant and acid stable. This means they are able to escape cooking, where most proteins are broken down, and the body's own defense mechanisms, including acid, which generally breaks down these proteins. The major allergenic foods in which greater than 85% are responsible for food allergies in children include milk, egg, soy, wheat, peanut, and tree nuts, and in adults, peanut, tree nuts, shellfish, and fish. These proteins stimulate the immune system, but there are actually different mechanisms that they can stimulate. Broadly, these are based into two categories, IgE, which is an allergic protein represented in the left upper hand corner as the Y, and cells. These are non-mediated, non-IgE mediated reactions. The IgE mediated reactions are your classic reactions that happen more commonly. These include anaphylaxis, wheezing, hives, vomiting, and diarrhea. The non-IgE mediated reactions are again mediated by cells. These tend to be more gut reactions, but can also include contact dermatitis. 
These tend to be very delayed reactions that can happen hours to days later, such as with food protein-induced enterocolitis. This is called FPIES for short. This is when people can have severe vomiting hours, up to three to four hours after exposure to what they're allergic to. And that vomiting can be so severe, they become dehydrated and lethargic. There are also mixed reactions. These are reactions that involve both IgE and cells. These include atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema, and also eosinophilic disorders. Eosinophils can damage the gut from the esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines. The most common of these is eosinophilic esophagitis. The eosinophils will, will attack the esophagus and cause so much damage that you can have difficulty swallowing and even have food stuck in the throat, known as food impaction. Now I realize this slide is a little bit complicated, but I just wanted to break down how this food protein actually enters the immune system and triggers a response. So to begin with, the food enters the gut. In the gut, the protein is broken down into very small proteins called antigens. And this is represented by the three circles attached by the lines. This protein is taken up by an antigen presenting cell shown here as a yellow oval. The antigen presenting cell then presents it to a T cell. The T cell can then either stimulate eosinophils, which cause damage, or stimulate B cells, or in fact both. When a T cell stimulates a B cell, B cells produce antibodies, which include the allergic IgE antibody. The IgE antibody here is shown as that Y-shaped character. The IgE can attach to IgE receptors on allergy cells, including mast cells and basophils. In this picture, we're showing a mast cell. When the food enters the body and is presented through the immune system to these cells, it can then attach to these IgE molecules. And then, like a key unlocking a door, forcing these mast cells to break open and release their contents, including histamine and other mediators that are responsible for the allergic reactions, including hives, vomiting, diarrhea, and even anaphylaxis. Now, I want to jump to something different, to adverse food reactions. These are non-allergic food reactions reactions that are not caused by the immune system. And these can be broadly broken down into two categories, toxic or pharmacologic reactions and non-toxic or intolerant reactions. The toxic or pharmacologic reactions do not involve host factors, which means anybody can experience these symptoms if in sufficient quantity. So for example, bacterial food poisoning, heavy metal poisoning, or scombroid fish poisoning. Scomboid fish poisoning is basically spoiled fish that develop histamine. Histamine is responsible for itching and flushing. And so when you eat these spoiled food, you get a histamine reaction of a flush and itching. But one important thing about scomboid fish poisoning is that everyone who eats the food would be affected. So it wouldn't be just one individual. Other pharmacologic effects include caffeine, which can cause jitteriness, or alcohol, intoxication. The non-toxic intolerant mechanisms are based on host factors. So the individual is missing an enzyme or pathway to digest the food so that they can properly process it and have food reactions. This would include lactase um, deficiency in which somebody does not have the enzyme to break down milk sugars. This would then cause bloating, diarrhea. There are other metabolic disorders that can cause this such as galactosemia, pancreatic insufficiency, gallbladder disease, and liver disease. But I want to highlight from this list gustatory rhinitis. Gustatory rhinitis is simply a runny nose when you eat. Many people come to an allergist thinking that they have a food allergy because they develop a runny nose when they eat. But in fact, this is a neuronally mediated reaction in which foods stimulate the nerves in the nose, in particular foods that are spicy and hot, but any food can do this. So this is not a true food allergy, but actually food is stimulating through the nerves to cause that runny nose. Other conditions that can mimic food allergies include GI diseases, such as irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease, and Crohn's disease. Each of these have similar symptoms of abdominal pain, bloating, 
diarrhea or constipation, or both. They all can be worse after eating, and so oftentimes people think they, they have a food allergy. But irritable bowel syndrome is not caused by the immune system, even though symptoms can be triggered by eating specific foods and following a meal. Celiac disease is an autoimmune reaction caused by eating gluten, a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. Crohn's disease is a chronic inflammatory disease of the digestive tract, but there is no evidence that foods ca food causes Crohn's disease, though certain foods can aggravate, especially during a flare-up. Other disorders not proven to be related to food allergy include migraines, behavioral and developmental disorders, arthritis, and seizures. There has been no research that has linked food allergies to these disorders. However, I want to point out that foods can trigger migraines, but they are not through the allergic immune pathway. So now you're probably thinking, since there are foods that can mimic a food allergy, how do I know if my symptoms are a food allergy? What always goes back to history. So keep a food symptom diary of triggers and timing to reactions. But there is testing available to actually verify suspicions of a food allergy. This includes skin testing and laboratory testing. Skin testing is shown in the upper corner. In skin testing, we drop a liquid allergen extract of the food we are questioning onto the skin and then prick through it. The immune system is in our skin. And so when it sees that, sees that food allergen, if you are allergic, it will react with a skin reaction of a hive with a wheel and a flare. Laboratory testing identifies IgE in the blood to the specific foods that are being tested. But as previously mentioned, there's a high rate of false positives, up to 50%, which is huge. So we always correlate symptom back to symptoms. Sometimes this is not enough to actually diagnose a food allergy. So sometimes an allergist will employ an oral food challenge. These are always done in the office and never at home. You want to make sure that you're with a staff that is trained to treat anaphylaxis. Other methods to diagnose a food allergy include food elimination diets. This is important with delayed food reactions because a delayed food reaction could not be identified in the office with an oral food challenge because the symptoms can happen 24 to 72 hours later. With these elimination diets, they're usually used for three to six weeks to see if symptoms resolve off the food. Sometimes the allergist will actually ask you to reintroduce the food to see if with reintroduction, your symptoms are reproducible. Other tests that might be necessary to diagnose a food allergy include biopsies of the gut and the skin or an endoscopy. If a biopsy is needed, if a skin biopsy is needed, we will send the patient to a dermatologist. If a biopsy of the gut is needed or an endoscopy, we would refer to a GI physician. There are few treatment options for a food allergy, and there is no cure. Treatment is focused on food avoidance, checking labels, and ensuring there's no cross-contamination, and always carrying an auto-injectable epinephrine device if you have an IgE-mediated reaction. There is now available oral immunotherapy, and this is used to train the immune system not to be so allergic, to de desensitize it. This is done by having patients in office ingest very small amounts of the food that they are allergic to and continually increasing that dose very slowly over time. Food allergies can be hugely impactful to quality of life and even health. People who think they have a food allergy oftentimes avoid that food and remove from the diet. This can sometimes lead to vitamin deficiencies and other health issues. So it's important to truly understand if you have a food allergy. 20 to 25% of the public perceive that they have a food allergy. But in fact, the true prevalence of food allergy in America is 4%. Infants and children, the prevalence is 4 to 5%. And in adults, it's 3.7%. But having said this, Allergies are truly a big problem in the United States and have hit epidemic levels. Between 1997 and 2011, 
food allergies among children increased 50%, and the increase in food allergies seems to continue to be on the rise. There are now 32 million Americans who have a food allergy, and severity also seems to be a problem, with 51% of adults and 42% of children reported to have had a severe food allergy reaction. And this is backed up by the diagnosis of anaphylaxis having increased 377% between 2007 and 2016. So if you are having adverse reactions to foods, it is important to understand if you have a food allergy and what that mechanism is. So talk to your doctor. Keep a food symptom diary and discuss whether seeing an allergist or testing is right for you. Remember, you do not have to suffer. Pursue understanding the cause of your symptoms so you can understand the best course of action to relieve your symptoms. Now we'll take some questions. First question, certain foods cause an intense burning feeling in my mouth. Is this an allergy or just an intolerance? Burning typically is not a classic symptom. However, sometimes people can misperceive how they feel. Sometimes itching might actually feel more like a burning. Sometimes when you have mouth swelling, tongue swelling, it can irritate other nerves um, in, the, in the mouth that can cause a sensation of burning. Um, this would be something that I would pursue to uh, see if you have a food allergy with further testing, skin testing, possibly blood testing. But these are not classic symptoms, so it is also possible it could be something else. One clue that we have with food allergies is that the symptoms are reproducible and happen every time you eat the food. So if this happens sometimes and not always, it's an inconsistent reaction, it may not be a food allergy. Next question, I have a very high IgE and constant itching. No one has been able to figure out what I am allergic to. Blood tests were positive for everything. How do I find the culprit? So this is very interesting, and this is something we see quite frequently in the clinic. Um, high IgE does not necessarily mean that you have a, a food allergy. There are other conditions that can actually drive very high IgE levels. I do think it's important that you would see an allergist to find out why your IgE level is high, if it's driven by allergies, food allergies, or environmental allergies, or if another condition is doing that. Skin itching that is chronic and uh, happens all the time can actually be due to other conditions, um, including inflammatory conditions in the body. Um, these would be, this would include things like um, autoimmune diseases, thyroid disease, any type of inflammation whatsoever can actually trigger the immune system, the allergic pathway, and dysregulate it and cause constant itching. So I would encourage you to see an allergist and pursue what the cause is. Next question. I cannot eat certain foods due to an intense burning sensation in my mouth, allergy or intolerance. Um, so this question we actually just answered. So again, um, I think that um, it's possible to be a food allergy, but I would explore that and actually see an allergist to make sure. Next question. When I eat chicken, I get sick. Is this an allergy? So it is suspicious that every time you eat chicken, you get sick. Um, it would be important to understand how you feel, if this is vomiting every time you eat or if it's another symptom that you experience. But if it's an isolated food, just chicken that you feel sick to, that would be very suspicious for a food allergy. So I would see an allergist and explore the underlying cause of that. Thank you. Next question. I've had severe eczema, hand eczema, for two years. What is the best easy food elimination? So this is a very interesting question. So typically, if eczema is isolated and not whole body, we don't typically think of a food allergy. Generally, food allergies driving eczema are whole body. However, there can be exceptions to this. If you're a food handler, if you prepare food, you can have a contact allergy as well. The top eight allergens that can cause food allergies are milk, egg, soy, wheat, fish, shellfish, peanut, tree nuts. 
um, though we're also seeing a lot more sesame allergy as well. Those would be um, the, the most likely culprits. However, eliminating foods from the diet can have significant consequences. So I actually would pursue seeing an allergist, having testing done, talking more about your symptoms to decide what that culprit might be. Other things to consider would be a chemical contact allergy in which it's something you're touching that's actually causing the severe hand eczema. Um, so follow-up question, dermatologist is prescribing Dupixent uh, for chronic, uh, and I, I apologize, I can't read the rest of this. Severe hand allergy. Ah, um, so Dupixent um, is a biologic medication um, that alters the allergic pathway. And it's used in both children and adults to treat um, eczema it's, it's a good medication that works well. As allergists, we always try and find that underlying cause because if we can identify that cause and remove it, that's half the battle in controlling the eczema. However, if food triggers, environmental triggers have been identified, elimination um, has been done, and you're still having eczema, then Dupixent would be um, an appropriate medication to try. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, it's a pleasure having had the opportunity to speak with you on food allergies, and I look forward to future episodes of talking with you.